Hello, how are you? My name is Brian Tierney, and I am a member of the Board of Trustees of Widener University and also a graduate of the Delaware Law School of Widener University. And it's a pleasure to be with you today and to have a chance to have a discussion about the Electoral College, some of its pros, some of its cons, some of its history, where it came, where it's heading, and uh, to uh, the distinguished panel we have here today. We have Dean Rod Smola of the uh, Delaware Law School of Widener University. We have Professor Jim Vike. Uh, who is a poli-sci uh, professor here at Widener University, and Professor Alan Garfield of the Delaware Law School at Widener University. All three of the panelists and myself will be engaging in this conversation. So let me start with you first, Dean. Um, what is the Electoral College? Well, Brian, it's not a college you can exactly apply to. Yeah, you don't get a, a diploma. And you don't get a down. diploma. They don't play sports. So it's not like Widener University mm -hmm. or University of Delaware. It is the strange way in which we elect presidents in the United States. And so most of us think, and we'll commonly say when we're going to cast our vote, oh, I'm going to vote for Hillary Clinton, or I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. But we're actually technically not doing that. In every state, we are instead voting for a slate of electors. And that slate of electors comprise the Electoral College. Every state has a different number. It depends on how many members you have in the House of Representatives. And then you get two extra for each of your two senators. So small states like Delaware have three because they have only one member of the House and two members of the Senate. A big state like California gets 55 because they have 53 members of the House and two senators. And there are states scattered all along that spectrum in between. So we vote by state for a slate of electors. And to win, you've got to get a majority of all the electors in the United States. And today, that's 538. There's three extra thrown in for the District of Columbia. The 23rd Amendment did that. So this system is set out in the Constitution. It was originally set out in the main body of the Constitution. It was then altered a bit in what's called the 12th Amendment. So the Constitution, 1787, here in Philadelphia as well, Created right? Created the Electoral right. College. And we'll 11 hear years why. after the Declaration. We'll hear what they had in mind and what their models were. Uh, it, it didn't work perfectly well. They, they made a little mistake. You weren't in the original Electoral College system required to differentiate between whether you were voting for president or vice president. This led to a famous tie between Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, it ended up having to go to the House of Representatives, in which it took many, many ballots to finally break the tie in favor of, of Jefferson. Alexander Hamilton had a major influence on that, and that made Aaron Burr very mad at him. And of course, they had ultimately had a duel, and oh, Burr shot that. and killed yeah, Hamilton. Yeah, that's right. uh, so we changed that a bit, fixed it a little bit in the 12th Amendment, and we've lived with it ever since. Professor Vike, where did this come from? What, 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 why not just have a popular vote? What was the? Well, kind of surprisingly, for, for if you look at today and, and some of the gridlock that we have and the uh, refusal of individuals to kind of compromise, mm -hmm. um, the Electoral College is an example of a, of a substantive compromise. Um, the uh, delegates at the Constitutional Convention were interested in moving forward with a, with a new uh, form of government. Um, they did have a notion of a separation of powers in mind, which would have an executive branch, a chief executive. They, they discussed several different uh, methods of actually structuring that and, and deciding on who that individual would be. Um, they considered direct election, and it failed to pass uh, among, the, among the delegates. They couldn't come up with uh, a sub a sufficient support for an electoral college or for a, a direct election. So the Electoral College came as a, as a compromise, um, ultimately putting in um, a intermediary between the people uh, and the selection of the president. Um, the, there were several concerns of the framers at the time, one of which was tyranny of the majority. They were fearful um, of the masses rising up and, and electing a, a leader. Uh, and they wanted to have some, uh, they ultimately decided on a compromise that would allow to, uh, some special elites to make the final decision. So in the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton spoke to the, the spirit of the people, that the, they get a sense of what the people want, but ultimately the electors would have the good judgment to evaluate uh, qualifications and make the final decision. So it would kind of calm down passions, if you will, if case, uh, or, I mean, it would it kind of 
Talk about that a little bit. So, um, actually, in other aspects of the of the Constitution, they used the term refinement, mm -hmm. which was a, a James mm -hmm. Madison term, where it actually talked about, well, we we have the masses, we have the people allowed to vote and participate, um, but we're going to refine their judgments. We're going to establish some systems in which people who are well educated uh, and well informed can actually make the final step and the mm -hmm. final decision. And and it's fair, isn't it, Jim, that, that the framers, as much as we love them, and, and, and as a, a great a miracle as the Constitution was in Philadelphia, they had flaws. They had values that we don't necessarily ascribe to today. Right. They believed in slavery. They were elitists. And uh, they, they were not entirely pro-democracy advocates. And so it was partly a kind of elitism. We, you know, were the educated, bright people. That's the kind of people that would be chosen as electors and safer to have that. Uh, they even had the idea of the College of Cardinals from the Roman Catholic Church in mind mm -hmm. as a kind of model for this, uh, this, this notion. So we're much more democratic today than they probably were back then. Right. Pro uh, Professor Garfield, talk a little bit about how it actually works. How, how does the Electoral College work? So we, like November 8th this year, we're going to have the election. All the states, we're going to hear who won per state and uh, what will happen next in terms of the Electoral College. So in each state, you're going to have the vote. Mm -hmm. And as Dean Smola said, even though it looks like you're voting for this individual candidate, what you're really doing is voting for the slate of electors. In all of the states except for Maine and Nebraska, whoever gets the largest number of votes is the one who's going to, it's going to be a winner take all system. They're going to get all of, the, all of the electors going to the electoral college. It's not split by one person gets 40% and one person gets 30%. So even if you win California, let's say the great the large state, of by yes. one vote, you get all, all of, of the, the electors. Votes. Okay. Exactly. Right. Uh, Maine, Except and, Maine, and Maine and Nebraska have a slightly different system where the winner on a statewide level gets the two votes for the senators. Mm -hmm. And then it's the winner of each congressional district that, you know, and, and you could have this happened uh, with Obama and McCain, where Obama won one of the congressional districts and got that one vote. McCain won the other two districts. He got those votes, plus because he won statewide, those two votes. And not to get us too far off track, but sure. why did those two states, so those two states want to, it's interesting, but Nebraska and Maine, you've got two kind of unique kind of culture, one more of a... Yeah, I'm not exactly sure where they did that. And, and mind you, it could make a difference. Pennsylvania recently considered switching to that kind of system. Mm -hmm. And there could be real political ramifications I for that. Imagine, because yeah. if the congressional districts are gerrymandered in such a way that you know, they tend to favor one party over another, it's quite possible you're going to get more representatives for one, for one candidate that doesn't reflect the statewide vote. Yeah. But in any event, so. The election is done, and later on in December, each state's electors meet in their state capitals and they cast their votes. These votes are then sealed and later sent to the president of the Senate, who opens them up and reads them before both houses of Congress on January 6th. As Dean Smollett said, you need a majority in order to be elected president, so you need 270 electoral votes. If you don't get 270 electoral votes, nobody has that, then it's thrown into the House of Representatives. They consider the top three contenders, and they vote. Uh, each state's representative panel only gets one vote. And so you need 26 votes in order to open So in that sense, just, just yeah, if it went that far, then what you're saying is the, the state of Delaware would have as many, as much sway as the state of California. Each state would have one vote. Even That's though the right. population is right. dramatically sure. different. And, and, right. and, and in and terms of modern Senate politics, it can have a dramatic impact. Because oh, yeah. you could have a majority of the House of Representatives, let's say, be Democrats. Right. But you could have a majority of the states be Republican states, right. in which you had a majority of Republicans within that delegation. And so the Democrats might have a handful of really large states with many representatives, but be way outnumbered in the House of Representatives, where every state gets one vote. So when it goes to the House of Representatives, all, all bets are off in terms of the way it works. And, right. uh, and when has it? Oh. Well, I was just going to say, yeah. as Professor uh, Veit was saying in the beginning, that 
The system we have is a product of the compromises they had to make to get the Constitution. So you had smaller states with smaller populations worried that their power was going to be overwhelmed by larger states right. with, with larger populations. That was the compromise they made in doing Congress, where each state gets you know, two representatives, whether it's Wyoming with half a million people right. or California with 39 million. Well, that just gets echoed again. So that's in the in U.S. The Senate. Each college. state gets two no matter what the population. Right. So right. in the electoral college, it's echoed a little because each state gets two. So you have a result of, in a state like California, one electoral uh, elector might represent, in effect, four times as many people as one elector in Wyoming. Uh, so it, you know, part of this is, as Madison was saying, is we've got a government that's a mixture of a population-based government and a state-based government. And some of that state-based government is what you're seeing right. in who decides who's going to be the president, which also reflects part of the kind of more elitist decision that we're going to leave it to this elite group to make the ultimate decision. So not a real problem as long as the popular vote kind of reflects the electoral college vote. Um, but uh, there's been a couple, seven or eight times, I guess, in mm -hmm. history when that hasn't been the case, m most recently in 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, wanted, Dean, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, a couple things can happen. You can, it, it's quite common for the person who is elected president to have less than 50 percent of the vote. They may still have won overall, but there might be some splinter candidates, some third right. party third candidates, party candidates, and, candidates and, right. and so the person might have under 50%. But quite a few times, a number of times, the person who actually finished in second place lost in the total popular vote, nevertheless won in the electoral vote. And if you notice all the election coverage in the uh, current election between Secretary Clinton and Mr. Trump, all we talk about is our electoral votes. We talk about who will win Ohio, who will win Florida. We speak in terms of that and not in terms of these raw numbers. And, and that's really the heart of the debate. Is it, is it a better system to vote state by state, and there are certain advantages to that, or is it a better system majority rules, which is our sort of most natural instinct? Right. And, the, and, and one of the things that's happening now is certain states are getting really no no TV ads. There's no, the candidates are hardly going right. there because it's they're either solidly Trump right. or solidly Clinton. So, the, so, so, so you why feel waste left your out if you're not in Ohio and Florida or North Carolina right. because you're not in a, you're not in one of these swing states yeah. where, where all the all the attention is. And so I'm sure my colleagues will have some ideas on it. I think it's a complicated question and a hard one because there's something mm -hmm. to be said for both systems. So talk about 2000 for a second, just because I think for some of our right. uh, students listening, you know, would, or watching this would be interested that that is kind of more recent and when what happened in terms of Bush v. Gore. Well, if you think about any general election, the eve of the of the presidential election or the the eve of the election day, uh, as soon as the polls close and they start projecting states, they will immediately know a substantial three quarters to eighty percent of the states. They will already know from prior polling who mm -hmm. is going to win that state. That leads to uh, a fairly pre-established uh, assuredness about the number of electoral college votes that you're going to get. So coming into a particular campaign, so Al Gore would know which states he was for sure going to win. George W. Bush would know which states he was certainly going to win. And they would be focusing in on battleground states. Um, the 2000 presidential election was quite unique. And right. just to let you know, people knew a lot less about the Electoral College going into that, yeah. uh, into that race. It came down, to Pennsylvania, or, uh, came down to Florida. Whoever won Florida was going to get the majority of the Electoral College votes. And as you know, they, they had uh, um, a very close uh, vote count there. It came down to just a little over 500 votes. Uh, was con contested in court, uh, but ultimately Supreme Court shut down the recount, and George W. Bush was awarded uh, the Electoral College votes from Florida and became President of the United States. And so he, if you added up all the popular votes from all 50 states and the district, he didn't have the, he didn't. Ha he had That's fewer correct. votes than Al Gore. That's correct. Al Gore received the the plurality. He received the most. Right. If you added up all the Americans votes. together, he received more votes. But when sure. you go state by state in electoral college, right. and and it, it came to the balance again in terms of Florida and the hanging chads and all those kinds of right. discussions that were going on, um, and incredibly graciously it, it said, for the good of the country, I'm not going to contest this, and I'm accepting the Supreme Court decision there. Well, earlier you mentioned, well, what if, what if you won California by one vote? Right. Well, just imagine the, the legal firestorm that would be around oh, yeah. uh, uh, Florida and, and the difficulty of actually resolving that. Uh, you also have, as constitutionally prescribed, a timeline. 
Uh, these things need to be, uh, the votes need to actually be decided on and forwarded um, by a specific date so you can determine who the president's going to be. There is a deadline. Um, and so in terms of Florida, there was actually quite substantial pressure right. on the time frame for, for recounting the votes. And, and actually in the Bush-Gore election, each of them got over 50 million. The difference was just 540,000. So in some ways they both had a fairly strong mm -hmm. uh, mandate from the country. But at the extreme, it's possible, you know, I read to win the Electoral College with just 22% of the popular vote. If you win your states by a very narrow right. margin and, and the other party wins their states by huge popular margins. So, you know, the, the question, as Dean Smolis said, is the president represents the whole country. And if this person is going to represent the whole country, you'd think the majority of the people should decide who that person is. And it is possible with the Electoral College that it's not going to work out that way. And we have this strange system because of compromises that were made long ago. And the question is, is there any benefit to keeping it now? Yeah. Now, of course, it would be very hard to amend the Constitution to get rid of it because it tends to advantage the smaller states and you need three quarters of the states to ratify any constitutional amendments so they have a disincentive to want to do it. But it is, it is ultimately undemocratic. It's not one person, one vote. It distorts it, right. particularly be, because of the impact of the Senate. And imagine you're being somebody in California uh, who knows this state's going to go Democratic anyway. Why bother? We always complain about uh, not enough people voting in elections, right. but it tends to suppress people's interest in, in wanting to participate. You know, on the other hand, some people would say the system is still good. It, it, it encourages candidates to try and have geographic diversity in their appeal. It forces them to focus on more states. Which, which was a core of the, of the original part, right? right? They wanted to make sure small states weren't ignored, that small yes. states, that's why the U.S. Sure. Senate, you know, the House is based upon population and the Senate is based upon each state having two. Um, it, but, so I don't want to get us too far in the weeds, but talk a little bit about how who picks the Electoral College, the electors? I mean, who? who yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, part, uh, party professionals. Mm -hmm. They're not allowed to be members of Congress. So they can't be elected? It varies slightly state by mm -hmm. state, but it's typically party loyalists within the state, sometimes picked by the candidates' own campaign, sometimes mm -hmm. picked by the, by the committee. Um, Allen said, you know, it would be tough to get a constitutional amendment to abolish the Electoral College because the small states have power, which is fair. But I think the real reason are the two major parties. Mm -hmm. Because re remember, it's, it's fascinating. When the framers created the Electoral uh, College, they didn't think they were going to be political parties. George Washington didn't want political parties. That's right. right. Then they came into our, society, in, into our country with a vengeance. And for the most part, it's been a two-party system. And the Electoral College has, the, has this overwhelming tendency to keep it a two-party system. It's almost impossible for a third-party candidate to gain any traction. You can have the unusual phenomenon of somebody like Donald Trump coming in from the outside to kind of take over a party, but it causes all sorts of schisms there. So the really interesting question for folks is, how wild or stable a country do you want to have in terms of our president? And do you want to open it up? Because if we didn't have the Electoral College, there would be multiple parties. And if you think about it in terms of today's politics, there'd be a Tea Party conservative group, right. there'd be a sort of moderate you know, uh, Republican group, there'd probably be a moderate Democratic group, there'd be a very far left group. Who knows where else people might come? And uh, that would be a dynamic new change. A lot of people would be invigorated. It'd be very unpredictable, but it would be the undoing of this system that we've been used and, to for and, 200 years. And you'd years. kind of be better off in a parliamentary, if you were going to have multi-parties, because there at least the government falls, right? I mean, in Italy, we've seen it in other countries where there's many, many parties. So, so that's why, that's how we got here, right? And, and, that's, why, and that's why it probably hasn't changed. Um, uh, so uh, what do you think? Is it a rigged system, or what do you think? What do you think? Is it rigged? I mean, is this a rigged system? Well, I think if, if I'm fundamentally, sorry, I some of the if, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Today. Uh, if you fundamentally look at it from the, it's a state participatory system, right? So it is not a, we're not going to have a national referendum on right. abol abolition of the uh, electoral college. It's ultimately up to the states, and I, I I always say that there's two different 
uh, features of the state, right, or the state interest. One is influence, right? The state would like to have influence on electoral outcomes. But another one that's often kind of overlooked, and which, which what Alan's getting at here, is choice, right? So in a state, when you keep using California, but I also want to bring up, say, New York and Texas, right. are additionally uh, very large populous states that have no particular uh, um, uncertainty relative to a presidential election. So there's influence. How much influence is this state going to have? And any state would like to have influence on the electoral system. Um, but there's also choice. So do we give our, our citizens of our state the opportunity to actually cast what might be viewed as a meaningful ballot? Uh, and so there's a desire to have your state be what's, what's typically called now a swing state or a battleground state. It gets you the potential for influence. It draws candidates to your state. It draws campaign money right. and advertisement money to your state. But it also gives your, candidate or your citizens more choice and a f greater levels of efficacy feeling that their vote actually matters. Now, the, right, the, on, on, on the rig thing, one thing that's fascinating is this system could change radically without a constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. Because the Constitution says to the states, you figure out how you're going to pick your electors. We tell you how many you get, but you pick them any way you want. Mm -hmm. So you know how states vied to be first in the primaries and be the first right. caucuses and so on. We could see a competition open up in which states say, we're going to go to a proportional system for the Electoral College. We're going to pick them in different ways. We're going to use the Nebraska model, things like that. We could start to see some experimentation among the states. And that each could state could do it. that, but on their own. On their own. By, yeah. And that, and that would, would take a constitutional change in that state or, or no. just a, well, the law? I mean, it, it depends the, on the, the Constitution just leaves it to each state legislature to, to decide how, how their electors is going to be selected. And in fact, in the early years in the country, none of them had popular votes to decide. The legislatures just decide. And eventually, they all moved to a system in where there were popular votes to decide on the electors. But there's many things states could do. So for instance, uh, instead of having a winner-take-all system, they could have a system that was proportionate to how people voted. That might people make people more motivated to participate. On the other hand, the state rewards the majority by giving all of the electors, the one who wins, to, to that one candidate. So that has its benefit. But right now you have states, some states have already entered into a compact that said, look, if enough states that control 270 electors agree, we're going to agree that whoever wins the popular vote, we're going to give all our electors to that. So in effect, New Jersey's agreed to that. So even if New Jersey were to go for Hillary, if Trump won the popular vote, they would give all of their electors to Trump. And that's a way without a constitutional amendment, if enough states agreed, to in effect have the- And is the that a law in New Jersey, or is no, that just that's a custom? That's a compact, a compact of, amongst states. a number of states. But they have, you know, whether they're ever going to get to 270 is, I think, probably unlikely. I think they've got about 160 electors right. from states There's that have agreed to do that. No. Um, it would require a change uh, if, if it was to go forward. The state would have to change the way they select electors. Sure. You wouldn't expect to have a, a, a slate of, uh, of Clinton uh, electors who are obligated to vote for for Trump if he was to win. Right. So you would have the state assign mm -hmm. uh, a list of electors who are bound to vote however the general And bound to vote. Let's talk about the yeah. idea of the faithless So here's elected, my, here's right? my uh, forthcoming novel. It's called The Electors. Now, it may seem a little crazy to you, but here's my hypothesis. You've got two presidential candidates, and they both turn out to have a lot of debilitating flaws. Mm -hmm. And so a group of electors from around the country, 15 or 20, call each other up on the phone. They don't even have to be in the same state. Ideally, they're in a state that has no criminal penalties against the elector if they vote for someone else than they were pledged to vote for. And some states ha make it a crime and other states Some are states make it a crime, some don't. But hmm. there are something like 29 states that don't make it a crime. That I could, in the end, pick so I can be I can be pledged for Mr. Trump or be pledged for Mrs. Clinton, but go and cast for whomever I want. So let's say 20 of them say, let's, let's cast our votes for Mike Pence or for Paul Ryan. And neither Secretary Clinton or Donald Trump gets to the 270. And now it goes to the House of Representatives. You get to pick three. among the top three. So you'd have Clinton, and you'd have Trump, and you'd have Mike Pence, or Paul Ryan, who mm -hmm. knows? And maybe in the House, at this point, they say, we don't want any of the top two candidates. We're going to go for number three. We think that's the, that's the most stable choice. That's my novel. Oh, that's I'll, really, I'll, I'll, that's I'll great. Fake names, but yeah. Uh, yeah. What, well, what, I contend that if you want to spice it up a little bit, yeah, you have good. A little, add a little time travel, 
Uh, and you bring Alexander Hamilton back. Uh -huh. Because, because the witness. faith, the, the like faith. Like in the big was, short where the people right. comes and they, and they yeah. talk yeah. to the camera. I kind of like that, that yeah. tyranny of the majority that so I realized it wasn't T I E. Right, right. It was all <laughs> so, but, but the, <laughs> the <laughs> elector that Alexander Hamilton actually envisioned is actually a faithless, I know. Uh, unbound elector. Someone I know. who will make a judgment as they see what's in the mm -hmm. best interest of the country in evaluating those. Now, it would probably cause civil disorder. Yeah. I mean, it would right. lack legitimacy, and that would be the downside. When you really dig in, it gets kind of complicated. I think we've done a great job in terms of uh, you know explaining this here. Luckily, it hasn't. Was is it eight times or seven times that? I think it was fewer times where the winner of the popular didn't win the electoral, electoral college. Vote. But I, you know, I think the thing that, to keep in other mind other than two thousand was eighteen eighty eight or something yeah, like that. So right, yeah, exactly. Right. I think the thing to keep in mind is this. On the one hand, maybe it's an imperfect system. Maybe it reflects compromises that made sense in 1787 that don't make sense today. Where it was a totally different country, four million people strewn across the, str the, the Atlantic seacoast without the kind of transportation and communication. How would people even inform themselves you know, to make the votes, to decide who to vote for? You could understand why they were more elitist. But on the other hand, I think we don't want to just condemn the system as rigged. The system has some advantages. First of all, even in those few times where the winner of the popular vote lost the Electoral College, it wasn't where the numbers on the right. Electoral were extremely off. Second of all, as Dean Smola said, it helps it helps promote a two-party system. If you win 25%, a third party in all of the states, you could end up getting no electoral votes. So it forces them to try and join up with the larger parties and for the larger parties to cater to them. And maybe that gives us stability. Maybe a two-party system is good. And if it helps make sure the candidates think in a geographic sense to reach out to more places and not just focus on the east and west coast and the big cities in Chicago, maybe that's a good thing too. Right. So uh, we haven't had too many elections where it's been, a, you know, in most elections, the winner of the popular is the same as the electoral college. The few that have happened have not been way off. Both in, arguably had a mandate and it has some benefits. So whether or not we should just get rid of it is I think actually a complicated question, you know, even assuming we could get rid of it. Any final uh, professor? Any? Well, clearly in terms of the campaign strategies uh, of the candidate, I'm a, I'm a political engagement guy. I, I really want people to, to be informed and be excited and be engaged and think that the, the elections matter and that outcomes matter and be exposed to, um, to, to the candidates and their ideas and their views. Um, in the 2012 election, the um, seven of the top ten major media markets had essentially zero campaign ads run. Seven of the top ten, right? Wow. So San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York City. So no money spent Forgoing whatsoever. Foregoing conclusion. Why waste my money? Right? I know I'm going to win or lose that state. Um, so let's Denver, the it. Denver media market, because Colorado was in play. They had fifty-five thousand campaign ads wow. and uh, over a hundred million dollars spent uh, by the major parties uh, and uh, and their surrogates. Um, we tend to think of, of the election, we talk about the election as, oh my goodness, it's, it's everywhere. When I'm watching TV, I see these ads all the time. And that's because we're in a Philadelphia major media market. Right. People in New Jersey and Delaware see the same program, so there's some spillover. Um, but Philadelphia isn't, or but Pennsylvania isn't really uh, that big of a battleground state compared to, to many others. There were actually only 4,000 ads. So if we think about uh, getting kind of uh, feeling overwhelmed by the by the flow of campaign ads, you ought to imagine what it's like, say, in Colorado or in Iowa. Seriously, you should be seeing ten times. You should be as seeing many. ten times the number of ads. Wow! And then you think about being in California. And they never buy newspaper ads. I used to be in the newspaper business. Now, you, now, you, now you're in San Francisco, <laughs> yeah. and what do you see? Nothing. Right. Nothing. New York City, major major media market. Nothing. Right? So it's, there's no lawn signs. If you don't have a, a contested Senate election or a local uh, um, House election, it doesn't even seem like there's a, there's a campaign going on at all. The only thing you can see is you can read the paper, you can get your updates right. on the phone right. or so forth, you can watch cable, cable news, right. but it's like it's not actually happening. And that's happening to a substantial uh, portion of our population where it's not, where they're not experiencing it. We talk about how, uh, how contentious it seems to be but that actually depends upon where you are geographically. And, and just one last thought, if you did get rid of the Electoral College, you gotta ask what you would replace it with. Right. 
And almost certainly it wouldn't be whoever gets the most votes wins because if we could have 10 parties and someone could get win with 11% of the vote or something like that. So we'd probably have a runoff system in mm -hmm. which we'd pick the top two or the top three and we'd, we'd have some percentage you'd have to win. And I kind of think that on balance that would be very invigorating for the democracy and it would allow ideology and the beliefs that people have and the alignments they have to kind of correct themselves. Because now we've got parties that are these strange amalgams of people with very different interests. The Republican Party particularly split quite dramatically. I think you could see sort of people find where their natural spots are right. and there'd be some power there and there'd be some influence there and then we'd see how it plays out. I think, it, I think probably for the reasons you've said, Jim, it would make us a more vibrant democracy. And to give an idea of what it could look like, and certainly I agree that in a, in a real democracy, you want every citizen to feel like their vote is important and, and they should feel the, the urge to participate and, ex and express and, and exercise their franchise where a lot of people in California, if they feel like, the, or it's Texas for Republicans, where they feel like it's sewn up, may not feel that. There was an example in the 19, after the 1968 election, um, Nixon got 56% of the electors, Humphrey only 35%, even though in the popular vote there was only a 1% difference nationally. And there was actually a bill to amend the Constitution that got through the House, it was filibustered in the Senate, but what the bill said is we're gonna have a national popular vote, you have to win 40% in order to be elected president. If you don't, we'll have a runoff between the top two contenders. So that's probably what you'd have to do. You'd have to have some kind of filtering runoff election to make And smaller sure. states oppose that? Is that kind of what they felt like they would They lose did that say or? that a lot of southern senators opposed it and a lot of both Democratic and Republican conservatives from small states, states opposed thought, right, it. They'd lose out on that. Exactly, because they understood. Yeah, it has led to the peaceful transition of governments, though. No question. Yes. And I joked earlier about the system being rigged because we all know it's not rigged. It, uh, there's poll watchers at every place, each party. There's independent poll watchers, etc. And uh, so I think that's an important message to get out there as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, thank Professor you. Professor Garfield, Professor Vike, Dean Smola. Thank you so much for being part of this uh, discussion today. And uh, the key thing is to make sure that everybody who can vote votes on Election Day. Be a good American. And uh, I want to also thank, a special thanks to Tim Sapansky, uh, uh, the director of the Widener Studio, and the crew here, his great team, for a great job that they've done. Thank you very much. <laughs>